this is Dr. Maggie Perry. <laughs> Tell me what you're proud of. My first member conversation is with someone who I've been working with for a long time for her OCD. So Sophie's name identifying life details and her voice is changed, but her experience with OCD will not be changed. So we'll just talk about in this episode, what was happening for her when she decided to seek psychotherapy and what that process has been like for her so far. So Sophie, thanks for joining me. Can you tell me what was happening when you decided to seek psychotherapy? Yeah, I think I was having a lot of anxiety overall, just about like a lot of different content areas. And I was having a lot of ideas about harming that I were really uncomfortable to me. And so like I was working and would be taking care of people and would feel like I had either was negligent with them or had harmed them in some way. And that was really anxiety causing to me. And it would lead me to like on my breaks or like at lunch, call my mom or call family or my boyfriend and kind of have them reassure me that I hadn't. And it got to be really like debilitating where I would be kind of doing that almost all day, just during downtime and stuff. And so, or even not downtime. So, you know, I would like sneak to the bathroom or something and do it. And so it was like kind of just really distressing. And I was having like OCD too with, or anxiety about if I, if I locked doors at night and things like that and the consequences that would happen if I hadn't. So that all led me to try to get therapy for it, which I thought I just had anxiety at the time. And then literally like I went on psychology today and you were like the first person that popped up that wasn't seemed too psychologist-y, I guess. It seemed like a normal person. Yeah. And then I didn't realize that you had specialized in OCD or even that I had OCD. So after I was working with you for a short time and then you diagnosed me with OCD, then it was, I guess I have OCD and everything else has kind of just transpired since then. Really great description. Thank you for that. So I know that you were suffering a lot at the time and experiencing a lot of anxiety. And so just for the listeners, let's just frame up anxiety versus OCD or how they're related from my perspective. So first off, how did you know that you had anxiety or what was making you feel like you had anxiety? Like what was happening in your body? I just like a really uncomfortable like sensation. You know, I'd feel my pulse quick in. I'd feel like my stomach drop. I just feel really out of control where like it was unpleasant feelings and I didn't really want them to keep going. So I would try to like make them stop or reassure myself that it wasn't as bad as it seemed or they would end soon or that I wanted to seek other support from people so that they could help me end them and those feelings. Yeah, really good description. So how modern science sees an anxiety state as a normal, natural, healthy, and adaptive reaction to a threat or a perceived threat. So you were perceiving a threat and then having a fight or flight response. So your pulse was quickening and your heart rate was quickening really, your blood pressure was going up, your body was not digesting and rather blood was shooting out to your arms and legs. Uh, it was likely that your chest was getting tight and your muscles are getting tight. You might've been breathing differently that was causing dizziness or tingly, that's um, over breathing or mild hyperventilation can make you kind of feel like dizzy and tingly. And then besides the fight or flight response, in the presence of anxiety, we have catastrophic thinking and the ur an urgent need to do something to make the experience go away. So to either make the sensations go away or to make the thoughts go away. And so the anxiety state, again, is normal, natural, and adaptive, and it's gonna peak and pass if the fear or the perceived threat peaks and passes. But in modern times, if you can imagine it, you can fear it and you can have the feeling of uncertainty around it. So an anxiety state becomes an anxiety disorder when we resist, brace and resist against sensations and thoughts themselves. And so really the difference between anxiety and OCD is primarily the to what degree it seems reasonable to you where with worry, you could have a thought like, what if I'm going to be late? And that could be an actual problem to solve, and you should take steps to ensure that you're not late. But it could just be intrusive thought that you regularly have, and then you do things to try to manage the uncertainty around that. And that worry could become a problem in and of itself. Similarly, you could have a thought like, how do I know that I didn't cause harm to someone, even if a part of me 
remembers providing good care, but the feeling of uncertainty and the anxiety that comes along with that could give you the urge to seek reassurance, to check on what you just did, to replay it in your mind, to Google it, to ask somebody else. And all of these things are basically attempts to make the uncertainty go away that unfortunately make the uncertainty, make your body more hypersensitive to the feeling of uncertainty and the stickiness of intrusive thoughts about it. So it sounds like that's what was happening. Does that resonate with you? Or do you have any thoughts or questions about that way of thinking about anxiety and OCD? No, I think that's my whole life. That's what you're describing, kind of, where it's just an uncomfortable sensation that then, like you were saying, it's you can have a thought that you felt like you gave quality care or that you did a good job or that you did certain things, but that there's like this overriding sensation in your brain where it's, yeah, but you probably didn't, or like maybe you should double check it or yeah, but like, here's all these other terrible things that could have happened if you weren't quite sure and you didn't quite do that. So I think that really resonates and is definitely like what my lived experience has been so far. Yeah. The yeah, but catastrophic thought seems like a very, a great kind of shorthand for the experience of OCD that also can happen in worry. But does that resonate with you that in many situations that are, that trigger your OCD content, your mind basically always does, yeah, but catastrophic thought? Yeah. Yeah. It can always come up with a series of catastrophic thoughts if one isn't enough. Yes. Okay. So were there any feelings or fears that you had to overcome to seek out treatment in the first place? I think no offense to your profession, but I think I had some rough goes with like psychotherapy before I started seeing you. Like I saw a therapist, like two traditional therapists, I guess, in college. And they were very like talk based and like, I guess, which is, that's what therapy is. You can cut that out. I don't think that that's an issue. (laughs) But like, it was just like very stereotypical where like you just sit on a couch and you just talk. And then the person kind of like asks, you know, like, oh, well, how do you feel about that? And blah, blah, blah. it like never really seemed to address anything that I was like actually having a hard time with. I'd kind of leave and be like, oh my gosh, but like, what about all my anxiety? You know, or like, what about like all these sensations and feelings and thoughts? And it would just be like, I was going out of obligation, not because like I was feeling just making me feel better. And, you know, they would ask, this is like, I guess you can cut this out, but this is like part of group when like people were saying that like, you know, they would be like, what about like your upbringing or, you know, like other relationships in your life, things like that. And it just like never resonated with me. And yeah, I hated it. Yeah. You're making a great point that OCD and other anxiety disorders are a biological vulnerability that can also be more likely because of some learning in your environment. So since you're likely to have a parent with an anxiety disorder, some of the ways that they think and respond are things that you also learn how to think and respond to, but you also have the biological vulnerability no matter what. So it's not so helpful to like dig into or look for traumas or repressed memories or something. That's not necessarily why you're feeling so anxious. Rather, your underlying biological vulnerability And the way that you're thinking and behaving in response is actually what's escalating your anxiety. And that's consistent with current science about anxiety disorders, but definitely not the lived experience for everyone in psychotherapy. So I'm happy to hear that you're shifting into something that feels helpful to you. Let's start, let's say more about what has been helpful. I think seeing you has been helpful because it's like kind of made me think about having OCD in like a framework. So it's like, I tend to do well thinking about things like in a framework, I guess, like it helps me kind of have a place to put everything in my brain. So it's like helpful for me, like, I guess you can probably say it more eloquently than I can, but just like that, because they're just sensations and feelings and like, they don't really matter. They're just like things that your brain creates and like kind of like the smarter you are, the like smarter those thoughts and feelings and whatever will pop up that can evoke feelings in you that are uncomfortable. So like having, I guess like after seeing you is helpful because it kind of, I used to be fearful of those thoughts and sensations. Like I would literally like 
not like going on walks or like long car drives and stuff because it would like I would feel that like I would have these things like and not know what to do with them and so it was helpful because now I don't fear like thoughts and sensations I just like know that they're like a natural byproduct of like being a human and like having OCD especially and then I kind of have learned different strategies based on the content to whether it be like to have self-talk around them or to just like let them be there or to label them and then, you know, do certain things with them. But that has helped a lot, I think, for me to kind of be able to understand myself better and deal with them. Yeah, all of that was really well said. So basically you learned the framework, not only what I just described about the anxiety state and then how avoidance creates, maintains, and intensifies the anxiety state. But so basically you are saying the framework that's been helpful is you have unwanted intrusive thoughts. They arrive with a spike of anxiety or other sensations and feelings. And you're learning like, it's okay that that thought is there. It's okay that these sensations and feelings are here. I don't have to act as though it's an urgent threat that I must do something about. Rather, I can see that as a normal experience that all humans have at sometimes. Some people have more often because of their biological vulnerabilities, but no threat to me. I can redirect my attention to stuff that I care about. And if I regularly learn how to do that, it's not as though my mind will never get sticky or that my body will never get sensitized. But in general, I'll be able to like regularly commit to things I care about and have variation and flexibility in my internal experience. And overall, that will feel like fulfilling and meaningful to me. So that's how I would frame up the framework. Does that fit your experience of it? Yeah, definitely. Okay. And I also want to just comment on what you're saying about long car rides or probably any amount of time by yourself used to scare you because you weren't sure what your thoughts were going to be and then what sensations and feelings you were going to have in response to that. So really happy to hear that you feel more comfortable just being with yourself alone. You don't fear thoughts themselves or sensations or feelings themselves. I assume or I know that some types of thoughts still can be really sticky for you still can make your body feel sensitized and give you the urge to do something to make it go away. So first, do you want to talk more about some of the content that you've gotten through and what your process was like to overcome some of your OCD? Yeah, I think most of my content like revolves around harm. So harm to myself, harm to others, or like harm just because like I didn't fulfill like obligations, I guess, or that was negligent in some way so I think that's like how most of my content has like manifested and I would say current content that I have is around like HIV and other infectious diseases but mostly HIV that's most prominent and I will either think that I'm getting it like it it alternates kind of between thinking that things that I do will give it to me and then change my life and let down those people that like are close to me or that I have it somehow and then I'm going to give it to people that are around me that I care about and that will harm them. So that's kind of, I would say, my latest content that's most active. Okay. And how can you tell that it's active? Like when you have, what types of life situations trigger that fear? And then what do you do in response? I think I can tell it's active because it occupies a lot of my brain most of the day. So it's kind of always in the back of my head as far as like um, if I, you know, use the bathroom or something, it's there. If I just sitting in classroom after and think, you know, I'm just trying to focus on other things, that's kind of like peppering me with thoughts that what if this happened? What if that happened? What if you were exposed to this? What does that mean? What would that be like? So definitely I can tell it's active because it takes up such a large portion of my like active thoughts for most of my waking hours, even if it's not actually what's exposing me to the thing that's triggering me, it's thoughts around that experience that happened, you know, maybe three hours ago or something. Yeah, really well said. And can you tell what maintains it? So if it's, if rather than the thoughts themselves being a threat, it's the feeling of uncertainty that you have about the thoughts. But actually, let's clarify that for a second. Can you tell, so typically, OCD is maintained both by beliefs that certain types of thoughts 
or content areas are threats or they are something, that, uh, some, a problem to solve, something to figure out, and or it's maintained by intolerance of the feeling of uncertainty. So that would be something like, I don't care whether or not this thought is true. I just want to do my compulsion or my avoidance to make the sensations and the feelings go away because I either don't want to tolerate them right now or I'm afraid they're going to get worse later and I'm afraid that I can't tolerate that later. So those two different, either being stuck in content or difficulty tolerating the distress that comes with OCD can both maintain OCD. Do you want to say more about your experience with either or both of those concepts? Yeah, I think um, they're both prominent. I think when I first got this HIV content or when it was most prominent for me, it was like over a trip I went on with some friends and had really prominent content that somehow I'd been exposed to it. And that was very distressing to me for like a long period of time or a relatively long period of time, like a month. And it was really hard for me to eat and function and do everything that I'm used to doing. And so that experience has made it difficult for me to have this content sometimes exist because I know how painful it was before. And so it makes me feel like, you know, I kind of want to avoid it. And when sensations come up, I want to just get reassurance. And by doing compulsions, because I know how painful it was and disruptive to my life, that this content was to me months ago. But then also, like, if I'm well-rested and feeling willing, I guess, like, you know, I woke up on the right side of the bed, I will be able to do exposures around that instead. So not checking with people, you know, to see, like, hey, would this have been something that would have exposed me to this? Not Googling things like symptoms or exposure situations. And I often, I find myself, like, acute to me as if, like, I feel really strongly, like I need to get tested. Like that's something that Maggie has helped me kind of like put an ultimatum on, that like that's not okay for me to do. Then that that's something that I don't want to start going down that spiral of like feeling like I need to get checked every day or, you know, after every time I use the restroom or something. So that kind of thinking has helped me too, because that's a cue sometimes where if I start feeling like all those sensations you were talking about earlier, and then I feel like an urge to go get tested, that's a good cue to me that like I'm sensitized right now, like, and I need to use other strategies that Maggie's talked about to like kind of not brace against them. Yes. Or do you get reassurance? Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say is when you first got this content, you felt really terrified. You started to do a lot of compulsions and the way you got stuck was really painful. It wasn't just lots of uh, worry and thinking about it, but it was also a lot of physical compulsions. And then it started impacting your everyday life. So how much, like you were having trouble eating, you were having trouble sleeping, it was hard to concentrate. Does that fit your experience? Yeah. And just kind of going to like the worst possible case scenario, like, oh, if I were to have this, this would change my life in this way, in this way, in this way. And you know, kind of just the more that vivid that those thoughts got, the more that I needed to brace against them and the more probable that the, they seemed. So yeah, it just kind of became a, a cyclical thing of like, then I would feel less ability to function. And then, you know. Yeah. So you had a really a lot of thought action fusion. And so thought action fusion being having the thought was making it feel like it was true. And basically the more vivid your images became, even if you did exposure like you tried to go towards something that you were otherwise bracing or compulsing against then you would have a thought about it and a vivid image about it and the intensity of the thought action fusion you were having at that time then made you think oh no even though maybe i was willing three minutes ago 30 minutes ago now i'm feeling afraid that this could actually be true or that I'm going to feel this way the rest of the day and that's going to get in the way of my life. So I better just do something to make it go away, like text someone, Google something, or do some type of compulsion. Does that fit your experience? Yeah. So it fits your experience that it seemed reasonable to compulse because of the fear of, because naturally in the anxiety state, all risks feel intolerable. So when you were really, really anxious, it felt really, really reasonable to do something to try to make the threat go away. Or again, even if you had some sense of like, this is probably my anxiety or my OCD talking, 
so I should probably not do my avoidance or my compulsive behavior. Another part of you felt afraid, well, if I don't do my compulsion, then I'm going to be anxious all day and that's going to ruin the day or potentially make it worse over time. So that's a really tough spot to be in. I'm glad that you saw that for what that was and then started to gradually chip away and really build willingness around going towards it, even though you felt terrified that you were going to be anxious all day. So when you first started getting out of that really painful state, how did you build willingness to do exposures and to not compulse after your exposures? I think when I was in that place for so long where I just really wasn't feeling good and was having trouble functioning, I think sometimes when I like am having such a hard time and the thoughts seem like they're so catastrophic, it's almost like that's when I have to surrender. And I don't want to say like surrender to the OCD, but more surrender that I'm having thoughts that like I can't control. And then that makes it so that like I can kind of not get past it, but just like relax a little bit, I guess and not feel like every thought that's coming in, I'm just like, <gasps> you know, like it's more real, it's more real. It's like, I just feel like it's like more than I can handle and it builds and it builds and it builds. And then kind of when it reaches that like point where it's going to like boil over, that's when I just like have to be like, all right, well, these are just all thoughts that like I can't really control, but now I need to like work on kind of like chipping away, like you were saying at these. So I think I get the willingness almost. It's like, I wish I had the willingness like five things before that sometimes where like I didn't let it build so high, but I'm not, that's the part I guess I'm working on still, but you know, kind of. That's really compassionate. Yeah. Yeah. I guess like that's the part that's like for growth, but just like figuring out that when it reaches that high point, like that's when it's time for me to like work on doing exposures. And it's almost like that just gives me the willingness to do them in that moment because I know that that's my only option. Like I'm against the wall, you know? So it's like when I'm there, it's time to start doing exposures. And then that builds my willingness, I think, as I do a few, then I'm like, okay, I think I'm still okay. So then I'll do a few more and then a few more. And then it's like kind of builds momentum. And I think that trajectory kind of like tends to work. I don't know. Like I said, that's how it goes. Like it builds, it builds, I'm against the wall. And then it kind of like a chip away at that. Yeah, that's great. So one thing that I want to just clarify, because I like the way you said it, when you were surrendering, you weren't surrendering to the OCD content, like it's fine if this is true, but rather you were surrendering to my mind is having thoughts that I can't control. Do you, do you see what I mean there? Yeah. And that was a big nuance. That's like total oxymoron, but like, it's just like, that was something that like I had to learn because I think in my head, I was like, oh, I'm worse. I just have to like, you know, cause you'll say, don't brace yourself against thoughts that you have. So I'd be like, okay, every thought that comes in, like I have to be okay with it being true. And like, that was really distressing for me. And then when you were like, no, that doesn't actually mean that. It means that like, you're just being okay with the thought, having the thought that that could be true. And then that was like a big, I think, turning point for me when I like actually started stuff started resonating more and like I found it be more effective because instead of things going against my values and you know having to be okay with things that I knew I wasn't okay with it was like me just learning like more compassion I think and being like I'm a human I have thoughts like in these thoughts like I can't control and that's okay you know and just like having it be like that and that's enough yes that was a very well said that was a great description of self-compassion. And I'm really happy to hear you say it like exactly like that. Back to the momentum, because I also liked your description there. When you're building momentum to go towards exposures, people do this differently. Some people like targeting the thing that's getting in the way of their life the most. Other people go after the, the smallest next step. Some people like to do the thing that is the most scary to them. And then they do, you know, like everything else kind of falls away from there. So no, there's no right way to do this. It's just whatever gives you motivation to consistently go towards your anxiety and your OCD is the best way for you. So with that in mind, what's the best way for you, Sophie? I think it's the idea like around HIV content, for instance, I started developing like rituals around like if I use the restroom in like a public place or how many times I felt like I need to wash my hands or like have hand sanitizer and like all those things are not things that I would have done before having OCD about this topic. So 
having to develop these like rituals that take more time and that aren't necessarily like values driven or that there's like a real purpose for other than like my OCD is telling me I need to do these things. Um, kind of, I could see how these would become small things that would then turn into like me never using a public restroom or me having to like go through an elaborate like half an hour hand washing thing for me to be able to feel clean and things like that which would I mean these are small things that like are kind of annoyances but I could see them becoming big things that would be really distressing and impact like my daily functioning a lot so that threat I think is what forced me maybe or like made me realize that like I was going down a path that wasn't consistent with maybe like what I aspire to have my life be like so that alone kind of gave me the willingness to start doing more exposures. Wonderful. So what I'm hearing you say is like you see the pattern. So if you're thinking about it as it's avoidances that create, maintain, and intensify my intrusive thoughts and the sensations that come with it, then even little moments are really problematic because there's the obvious situational avoidances like not using public bathrooms or getting caught washing for half an hour. But what really keeps a problem like this going is these really like subtle, small moments where you have an intrusion, you have a feeling, oh, I could just text someone really quick, oh, I could just think it through again and make it go away. And if you can catch, like, actually, those are not small moments. Those moments over time is what really add up to me losing a bunch of time, feeling really distressed, and potentially being really impaired. I'm really happy to see how you can see how that's all connected. Okay, so then with that in mind, and just an awareness of our time, do you want to say more about how you've already done exposures to this content area and then like actually where you are right now in a way that you can commit to exposures in the coming week or two? So yeah, I think exposures I've already done. I think the biggest one was just like not going to get tested every time I want to. Anytime that like it, it dawns in my head like, oh, I should, you know, just seek certainty around this and it would be so easy to just go get tested that's an exposure, just like when I kind of don't let myself do that or give into that. And I've had to do that sometimes daily, sometimes weekly, sometimes like 20 times a day. It really just depends on kind of like the day that I'm having. But that's like a hard and fast, like I was saying, kind of an ultimatum for myself or like whatever I'm feeling like and how bad the sensations are, like I can't go get checked. So I just want to reinforce what you just said, that it just depends on what kind of day you're having. So it's the, that thought is not any more likely or more of a threat to you. Some days you're a lot more sensitized than other days. So some days that, that thought intrudes a bunch. Other days it might barely even be there. It has more to do with how sensitized your body is and how sticky your mind is than whether or not that's actually a threat. That fits your experience? Yeah, definitely. Great. So that's a really good commitment. I'm never going to get tested. Uh, what else have you already done? as exposure so i've kind of as another ultimatum like i'll always like use public restrooms when they're available no matter the condition of them so that's something that's sometimes challenging because you can't predict how everyone else's hygiene is around you so that's something that is kind of an ultimatum for me too and others are just like um I'll like find myself like wanting to wash my hands again because it didn't feel like the first time was like thorough enough or it was a really gross bathroom so you know or I had a cut on my hand and so but I'll just like do it once and then like leave and then not go back and wash my hands more and deal with the anxiety that that kind of makes me feel and then things that I like want to that I'm like still aspiring to are just not checking with other people around me like or you know like my family or my boyfriend that a certain experience that was like unexpected around this content wasn't too much and that that wasn't I don't want to say too much but just that it was like more than I could handle and more than I was prepared for so that that somehow because it's unexpected or more sticky makes me feel like I need to get uh, certainty around that instantly so like delaying I think is a good idea for working on that and making it be where if I'm going to talk about it, I need to talk about it either in person with somebody that 
is in that category of people or like on the phone if it's people I don't see very often because that will force me to delay at least like multiple hours if not multiple days. Great. And I just want to reinforce that concept that because anxiety and OCD both feel really urgent, you know, the thought shows up with a sense of urgency and the need to, the urge to do something immediately to make it go away. So just by committing to delaying whatever it is that you want to do, you're overriding the urgency that comes with the fight or flight response and the, the anxious response. And then hopefully by the time the delay is over, your prefrontal cortex is back online and you can actually make a decision about whether or not you want to talk to that somebody in person or by phone, but just making a commitment to not immediately texting someone or immediately getting relief can help you slow down and observe what's happening. So I really like that commitment. Okay. Well, all of those are really good commitments. Thank you for your time today. You did a great job. We will see you next time.